Well, the week I was studying this lesson happened to be the week of Mother's Day, and I was just getting ready to sit down to study when my son called me. And he lives in Wichita, Kansas. He's a pastor there. And I jokingly said, is this my pre-Mother's Day call? And he said, well, kind of. He said, I was wondering if we could meet Saturday for Mother's Day lunch. And he wanted to go to Stillwater, which is halfway for him and halfway for me. And so I said, of course. And we, I accepted and we chatted for just a moment. And then I began my lesson, uh, my study time. You know, Mother's Day is a hallmark card opportunity in the secular world we live in, isn't it? But in the spiritual world, Mother's Day should be a wholehearted calling opportunity as we as Christian mothers soberly evaluate our high calling before God. And ladies, I hope Mother's Day has not become a time for us to be indulgent, but to be diligent in pondering our God-given role. Uh, many Christian women today, I know because I've met many of them, many Christian women today have vacated their role as a parent, and they are leaving a grim legacy for their children. It is the wise mother who will consider her biblical role as a mother and endeavor to fulfill that role with godly fear. And so as we consider our lesson tonight, we're going to look not only at a godly mother, we're going to look at a godly grandmother, and also a spiritual father that impacted one young man, and his name is Timothy. So let's read the text together, and I'll give you an outline of where we're going to go. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. Paul writes this, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you being mindful of your tears that I might be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded it's in you also. So we're going to have uh, just a two-fold outline. We're going to look, first of all, at the qualities of those who mark Timothy's life. The First of all, the qualities of his spiritual father, and we'll see that in verses 3 to 4, the qualities of his spiritual father in verses 3 and 4. And then lastly, the qualities in his physical mother and grandmother, the qualities in his physical mother and grandmother in verse 5. Now, for those of you who weren't here last week, and even for those of you that were here last week, because I know you've slept at least seven nights since then, so hopefully you've slept seven nights since then, but you may have forgotten our introductory lesson. Uh, Paul began by opening this letter by mentioning four persons. Remember, it was God, Jesus, Paul, and Timothy. Two were infinite beings, two were finite beings. We also saw that there was a promise that was given, and that promise was given was life eternal. And then lastly, we also saw that peace was promised, but we saw that we cannot have peace unless we've been a recipient of the grace and mercy shown to us from God the Father. And so that was the opening last week. That was a greeting. There was a lot of background information. And so uh, if you were not here, you can watch it on YouTube or uh, you can listen on the website. So after his initial greetings, Paul begins the body of his letter. And as he does, we should be struck by the first quality of this man who's sitting in prison, let me remind you, he's chained to two soldiers, he has very little food, very little water, uh, there is a sickening, sickening stench from toilets, there's male and female prisoners incarcerated together, not to mention the sexual immorality that went on in prison life. In fact, do you know most Roman prisoners committed suicide because the conditions were so bad? And what words does Paul begin with? I'm miserable here. I want out of this place. I wish you guys would pray for me to get me out of here. Nope. Look at his first words. I thank God. I thank God. God. Ladies, the first quality of this godly apostle who poured his life into Timothy is 
thankfulness. Thankfulness. I thank God. What an example for you and I to follow. In fact, wasn't it the Apostle Paul who wrote that we are to be thankful in all things for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us? What an example for us to follow, but also what a great way to begin a letter or a greeting to someone. I thank God. Ladies, this is very important. Paul chose to be thankful in the midst of difficult circumstances and in the midst of facing death. Remember we saw last week, not too long after writing this letter, he was beheaded by Nero. And yet he chooses to be thankful. You know, Paul chooses to dwell on things that are lovely, good, pure, and not on things that are unlovely and awful and evil. He chooses to, to, to dwell on things that are holy. Now, who does he give thanks to? This is very important. He says, I thank God. And you might say, well, why is that, why is that important? Well, ladies, even when we are thankful for other people and the gifts that God has given to them and what they've done in our life and how they've influenced us, do you know that primarily we should thank God for that person? We should thank God for making that person, for gifting that person with the spiritual gifts, so we are thankful to God, right? And ladies, we need to remember everything we have, every spiritual gift we have is because of God and God alone, right? And so we should thank God for others in the body of Christ that are using their gifts for his glory. And we must never forget that. We must never forget that it is God who gifts us and God who blesses us because uh, our hearts can be lifted up with pride and we will become like our culture that is obsessed with themselves. And we don't want to be like that, right? In fact, I was reminded this morning in my uh, daily Bible reading, I'm reading uh, in Daniel right now, and I thought, what a contrast. First, we have this young man, Daniel. He's humble. He does does the right thing before the Lord, and then God exalts him. And then we have Nebuchadnezzar a few chapters later, and he lifts up his heart in pride, and he stands against the Lord, and what happens? <laughs> the Lord humbles him, right? And you know the story. And so, ladies, we would be wise to remember to thank God. Do not let your heart be lifted up in pride. And so Paul says, I thank God. God. Well, in another letter to the church at Rome, Paul writes something very similar, Romans 1.8. He says, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So it's interesting, Paul is realizing that the Roman church, that they have salvation, that they're, they have genuine faith, but he says, I thank God for that. He doesn't thank the church at Rome, but he thanks God. Well, Paul's not only thankful, but notice the second quality of this man. He says, I thank God whom I serve. So the second quality of this man that poured into Timothy is that he was a servant of God. He is a servant of God. He says, this God that I give thanks to, this is the one I serve. I am his servant. In fact, the Greek word for servant just means to minister. And ladies, you can read the Pauline epistles, and it goes without saying, Paul was a slave of the Lord. I don't know if you've ever read all the things that Paul went through, but this man was a slave of the Lord. He went through difficult circumstances. He encountered difficult people. He traveled in dangerous areas just to get the gospel out. He risked his life for others and for God. He was a servant. He was a slave. He went wherever God wanted him to go. In fact, Paul's life was one of a living sacrifice for the God who saved him. And note how he serves God. He says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience. A pure conscience. This means that Paul's conscience was clean. It was morally pure. This is the third quality of Paul. Paul had a pure conscience, a clean conscience. In fact, we're going to see later on, he's going to talk to Timothy and to the church at Ephesus and to us the importance of being a vessel that is fit and pure and clean for the master's use. Ladies, do not try to serve the Lord 
without a clean conscience. As Paul said in another place in Acts, he says, I strive to keep, keep short accounts with God and with man. I strive to have a pure conscience. Now you might say, well, what's a conscience? What is a conscience? Our conscience is that eternal part of us that gives us a moral sense of right and wrong. That's your conscience. And by the way, ladies, that is a part of you that you want to keep clean. Don't defile your conscience. Don't sin against your conscience. You know, I've met women that have done that. They, they sin against their conscience. They don't keep their conscience clean. And a lot of times they end up with what Paul says, a seared conscience. That's a dangerous place to be. In fact, Paul reminds us uh, this in 1 Timothy chapter 4. He says, The Spirit speaks expressly that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, that's a picture, isn't it? In fact, this afternoon, I know I'm still one of those old-fashioned people that iron. My sisters say, Susan, nobody irons but you. But I still iron. And, uh, you know, I was ironing. And you think about if you leave that iron on too long, on, and I've done that and burned some of my clothes, but uh, to sear something, don't defile your conscience. Keep your conscience clean. Or you could become like what Paul says, have a seared conscience, or even worse, what he says in Romans chapter 1, a reprobate mind. Keep your conscience clean. Keep short accounts with God and men. If you have an offense with someone, take care of it, as Jesus says, immediately, right? If you sinned against the Lord, take care of it immediately. Don't put it off. Well, he then writes of the fact that his forefathers served God with a pure conscience. Did you notice that? I thought that was interesting. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. In fact, turn over to Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24, because Paul mentions this there in Acts 24, uh, beginning in verse 10. Notice what he says. Then Paul, after the governor had nodded him to speak, answered, Insomuch as I know you've been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because you may ascertain that it is no more than twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone, nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogue or in the city. Nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my, here it is, the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. And so who would the forefathers be? Who would Paul's fathers be? Well, they would have been what? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now remember, ladies, Paul was a Jew. Remember, he was a Jew. He would have been well-versed in the law, the first five books of Moses. In fact, do you know most Jewish boys had the first five books of Moses memorized? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Psalm 1 says what? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's the first five books of Moses. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he what? meditates day and night. And so Paul would have had the first five books of Moses memorized. You know anybody that has the first five books of, I don't. But, uh, and so the rabbis would teach their disciples this. And remember, he was brought up at the feet of Gamal. He talks about that in Acts 22, uh, 3. And he talks that Gamal taught him about his forefathers. And the way the rabbis would teach the young Jewish boys is through questions and answers and memorization, uh, which is a lost art in our culture. But uh, most people before us used to memorize great portions of God's word. And I'm sure that that Paul learned much through the memorization of the law as to the integrity of his forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so he says, not only do I have a pure conscience, but also my forefathers. Now, I want to bring something out before we go on. I want to bring out here a very important thing. Paul himself, 
was discipled. Did you notice that? By Gamal. He was discipled. And yet, he discipled another man named Timothy and Titus, and he discipled a lot of men. And ladies, this is imperative for all of us. Every one of you in this room should be discipling someone else. At the same time, you yourself should be discipled by someone. This is a principle that's taught often in scriptures. In fact, when we get to uh, chapter 2 of Timothy, he's going to say, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you've heard from me, Timothy, pass on to faithful men who will be able to pass on to others who will be able to pass on to others. And so we should always be passing the baton of truth down to the next generation at the same time while we're being taught. And so this is a biblical principle in scripture. Well, Paul is not only a thankful man, he's not only a servant, he's not only a man who possesses a clean conscience, but he's a man of prayer as evidenced by what he writes next. Look what he says. He says, I pray without ceasing night and day. Ladies, this is the fourth quality of the man who poured his life into Timothy. He was a praying man. He tells Timothy, in fact, he says, I pray for you night and day. In fact, it's an interesting uh, Greek phrase. It means a recollection recital. And uh, I was thinking about that because uh, when I was growing up, I took piano lessons. And if you've ever practiced for a recital, you got to do it over and over and over again and then over again again, right? And so it's like that what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, that we are to what? Pray without ceasing, that uninterrupted prayer. And we should always be praying. And that's what Paul is saying. Every time I think about you, Timothy, I pray for you. Now, ladies, obviously he's not saying I pray for you 24-7 and I don't pray for anyone else and I stay up all night in prayer for you. That's not what he's talking about. But he's saying this is a reoccurring event in my life. I pray for you. And ladies, I have, you have people like that on your heart, people that you disciple or your children or your grandchildren, and they come into your mind, and you what? You just pray for them all the time. They're constantly there. And so he says, I pray for you, Timothy, night and day. In fact, uh, his mind and his heart goes to God in prayer throughout day and night. And uh, I think that, you know, that's only natural when we consider the ones that we pour our lives into. And I'm sure Paul sitting there in prison um, in those condition, the nights were often very long for Paul. But instead of dwelling on his awful situation that he was in, he dwelt on his awesome Savior and he petitioned for his son in the faith. And ladies, we can learn a lot from the Apostle Paul uh, because I know that many times we go through deep, dark times and our temptation is to murmur and complain about our situation and instead we should be pouring out our heart to the Lord during that time, not only for ourselves, but for others as seen here by the Apostle Paul. And you know, when you think about it, what a, wonder what he prayed for Timothy. I mean, there's a lot of things he could have prayed for Timothy. Uh, his timidity, his fears, maybe his physical needs. We know uh, Timothy had stomach problems, uh, but probably more than anything else, I imagine the Apostle Paul prayed that Timothy would hold fast to the truth because that's what we're going to see throughout this whole letter. Hold fast to the truth. I know the time of my departure is at hand. I've already been told the time of my departure is at hand. And Timothy, hold fast to what is true. And again, ladies, Paul sets an example for you and me to not be anxious about anything or anyone, but to pray instead. In fact, that's what Paul tells the church at Philippi. We're not to be anxious about anything, but in everything. What? By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let our requests be made known to God. And then what happens? The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, does what? It guards our heart and our minds through Christ Jesus. And ladies, we must choose worry over praying. If we don't, we become like the world, right? without peace. We must petition the throne of grace to find mercy in our time of need. And we see Paul doing this in prison. And remember, it wasn't the best of circumstances. 
Well, there's two more qualities mentioned in verse 4 of the Apostle Paul. Notice what he writes. I greatly desire to see you being mindful of your tears that I might be filled with joy. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, I greatly desire to see you, which means I have a great yearning to see you, Timothy. And the reason is, he says, the reason I want to see you because I am being reminded of your sadness. I'm reminded that you're sad because you know you're going to lose your mentor. Ladies, we cannot help but see the fifth quality of this man, Paul. He was a man of loving compassion. Paul was not a cold theologian. I don't know where we get that idea. He was a man that had loving compassion. His heart was tender. It was warm. It was not calloused. It was not cold. Paul hurt with the hurt of others. And when he thought about Timothy and the fact that, and he was reminded of Timothy's tears, it what? His heart went out to him. In fact, Paul the Apostle tells us in Romans, we're to what? Rejoice with those who rejoice and what? Weep with those who weep. And here we see Paul doing that. Now, did Paul actually see Timothy cry at some point? What's he referring to when he says, I remember your tears? Well, turn back over to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. More than likely, this might have been, this or one other account may have been the time that Paul is thinking about as he's sitting there in prison, knowing this is his last letter to his son in the faith. Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 17, this is when Paul tells the elders goodbye at Ephesus. And remember, Timothy was the pastor of the church at Ephesus. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus, and he called for the elders of the church, and when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and to the Greeks repentance toward God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And see... Now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying, Chains and tribulations await me, but none of these things move me. I don't count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I've gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore I testify you this day I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourself, to all the flock which among the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will arise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore watch, remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those that are sanctified. I haven't coveted anyone's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And when he said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Notice verse 37. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words he spoke and that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Timothy, more than likely, was there. Remember, he's the pastor. Paul's calling the church, at, the elders at Ephesus together, and he's saying, I know this, after I leave, some of you, even on the elder board, are going to draw away disciples after you. You're going to apostatize from the faith and bring people with you. And Timothy's there. 
And so that could have been what Paul is, he says, when I call to remembrance your tears. And it must have been a very emotional time. There could have been possibly one other time right before Paul's final arrest, because we know Timothy does come to him before he's beheaded. And so there could be that time, too, that Paul is referring to when Timothy knew that this would be the last time that he would see his mentor alive, and he cried. And ladies, do not think ill will of Timothy and his tears. You know, we live in a robotic society that wants people to get over it when someone dies. I still remember many, many years ago when a good friend of mine died, and um, she died on a Wednesday, and there was church that night, and I told Doug, I said, um, I, don't, I don't think I can go to church. I'm just too emotional. I had been in their home for two weeks helping take care of her, and I said, I just don't think I'm going. He said, no, it'll be okay. You'll be with the body. They'll, they'll love on you and all that. So I walked through the door, not this church, but I walked through the door, and first woman I met, she goes, why are you crying? She's in heaven. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and, you know, as a pastor's wife, and that was many years ago, I thought, I want to remember that. You weep with those who weep. And uh, I think in our culture, uh, we don't allow people to mourn. Even Jesus wept. Remember when Lazarus died? It says what? Jesus wept. You look at the Old Testament, and you know when some of the patriarchs died? Do you know they wept for 30 to 70 days? I mean, we have a funeral one day, and we expect everybody to, you know, be at the fair the next day or something. Uh, we don't allow people to weep. In 2 Kings, we have another account of two men. Remember Elisha and Elijah? They were also in a mentoring relationship. And remember when uh, Elijah was Elisha's spiritual father and Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind to heaven? You remember that? And Elisha saw him no more. And you know what the Bible says? He rent his clothes in two, which was what? A sign of mourning. He wept. His, his mentor, what? Send it into heaven through a whirlwind. And he wept. Uh, we also have the account of David and Jonathan. Remember, their souls were knit together. And remember when Jonathan was killed in battle and David wrote this lament about Jonathan and he said, your love was surpassing that of women. And he loved him. He was his soulmate. And he was weeping. And so I think we need to not think ill of Timothy that he was crying. He's not a crybaby. Uh, Paul had invested a great amount of time into this young man. And so Paul says, when I call to remembrance your tears, he said, it's a, it's a difficult thing. Well, we come to the sixth and final quality of this man, Paul, who poured into Timothy, and that is Paul was a man of joy. He was a man of joy. Notice what he says. He says, greatly desiring to see your face, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. You know what Paul's saying? He's saying, Paul or Timothy, I would like to see you again so that I can be filled with joy when I see your joy. When I see your joy, Timothy, on your face, when I see you again, that will bring me joy. Ladies, Paul was facing death, and nothing would bring him more joy than to see Timothy one last time and to see his joy. And, you know, that should be for all of us. In fact, today at lunch I met a gal that used to go to church here. She now lives in Kansas, and, and uh, I was waiting for her in the restaurant. As soon as she walked in, her lit, face lit up, my face lit up, you know? Hey, Tiffany, been a long time, two months since I've seen you. And uh, I was excited to see her, you know, and she was excited to see me. Or uh, sometime in the next few months, I hope to see both sets of my grandchildren. I have opportunity to see them both. And I've thought about and I, their little faces. Hopefully they'll be happy to see Grandma. So I haven't seen her in a while, and I'll be happy too. And that's what Paul says. I, I, when I call to remember, it's not just your tears, but the joy I'm going to have. Not my joy necessarily, but Timothy, your joy, to see the joy on on your face when I get to see you one more time. In fact, to be filled with joy means that Paul would be filled up with gladness and calm delight. Ladies, notice, Paul's joy would not come as a result of some monetary gift or release from prison, but it comes when he sees the joy of others. Does that describe you? Do you rejoice with those who rejoice? Are you excited when someone else is joyful? We should be. 
Paul's joy was not only the thought of Timothy being joyful, but also he experienced joy when he thought of Timothy's heritage, the one which came from his mother and his grandmother. And this was doubling his joy. And so we turn from the qualities of his spiritual father, uh, Paul, who invested in him, to now the qualities of his mother and his grandmother. Look at verse 5 as we close. He says, when I call to remembrance, remember he's still talking about joy, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that's in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded it's in you also. So Paul's joy is not only because of the hope of seeing Timothy one more time and noted, noting that he will be joyful, but it also has to do with Timothy's faith. He says, I, and that makes me joyful to think about the faith which first dwelt in your grandmother and your mother, but Timothy, guess what? It dwells in you too. He says, when I remember your faith, which is genuine, which is sincere, it brings me joy. Ladies, it's worth noting that Paul writes of this genuine faith, not only here, but in 1 Timothy, he writes about it. He says, the purpose of commandment is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, there's that conscience again, and sincere faith. Paul was not in doubt of the man that Timothy was. In fact, uh, I hope you did your homework, but in Philippians, he brings out several qualities of this man that I think are worth noting because one of the questions I asked you on your homework was what are the qualities of genuine faith, right? Uh, how could we know for sure that someone is a believer? But in Philippians, he says a, several things about Timothy. He talks about Timothy, and he talks to the church at Philippi, and he says, I have no one like-minded who will naturally care for your state. All seek their own, not the things that are Jesus Christ, but you know him, Timothy, his proven character he was as a son with the father, as with a father, he served with me in the gospel. And then he says, therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. And so you look at that small portion of scripture, you can see a lot about Timothy. He was a servant. He was a soulmate of Paul. He was selfless. He was sincere. He was serving with Paul as a son with a father, and he was serving together with him in the gospel. I mean, that's packed in those few short verses in Philippians chapter 2. And Paul says, I know that your faith is genuine. Not only could he observe uh, things, but he traveled with Timothy. And you know, when you travel with someone, you get to know them pretty well, don't you? I mean, Daniel and I just got back from Africa, and we traveled 10 days together. Debbie and I have been traveling together for 20 years, and, or over 20 years now. And uh, so, you know, S Cindy, my daughter, says, Mom, you act like an old married couple. So <laughs> we're more like sisters than, uh, you know, friends because we travel so much, and we probably treat each other like sisters. I don't know if that's good or bad. But um, Paul had traveled with Timothy. He observed his life. He didn't have to, you know, is this guy really a Christian or not? I'm not sure if he's a Christian. He knew he was a man of sincere faith. He knew it by the fruits. And ladies, I pray that God would give us more Timothys for our day. We need more young men and women who will follow in the steps of uh, the Apostle Paul. Well, thinking about Timothy's soul being redeemed brought him great joy. Now, you might say, well, where did Timothy first learn about Christianity? Notice what Paul says. This faith dwelt first in your grandmother and your mother. Now, if you like meanings of name, Lois means a Christian woman, and Eunice means victorious. And it's interesting because the word dwelt, when he said it dwelt in your grandmother and your mother, the word dwelt is in the past tense in the Greek, which means his mother and his grandmother were no longer living at the time that Paul wrote this epistle. But evidently, Paul had come to know both of these women. We know this from Acts 16.1, when it says, Paul came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there who his name was Timothy. Uh, he was of a Jewish woman, but his father was a Greek. Now, we do not know we do not know how these two women came to faith. Scripture does not tell us. But we do know that these two women greatly influenced Timothy. And things were a little different in the biblical world than in our world because in the biblical world, uh, grandparents usually lived with the family. And I know that we, you know, 
we put grandparents in a nursing home. But uh, in the biblical world, what they would do, they would have a, the father's house would be the main thing, and then they would have little dwellings around the father's house, and the family kind of all stayed together. And so uh, Timothy's grandmother would have been very involved uh, in the rearing of Timothy and instructing him. We know that Timothy's father was a Greek and appeared to be an unbeliever, and so Timothy's mother and grandmother taught him the word of God. In fact, Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.15 that from a child you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation which is in Christ Jesus. And you might say, well, how did they know the scriptures to teach them, teach Timothy? Well, Paul is very clear in Colossians that we are to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. And the biblical world, uh, most homes did not have a copy of the word of God. And so Timothy's mother and his grandmother would have probably been like most, uh, they would have memorized great portions of God's word. They had it in their mind and they passed it on to young Timothy. And so they taught him the holy scriptures from a child. Now, one man helps us understand a little bit of what was going on during that time. He says, even though fathers were responsible for their son's education, Judaism and Greco-Roman aristocrats wanted mothers to be knowledgeable so they could impart knowledge to their young children. <clears throat> Until the age of seven, a Roman boy's mother was his main formative influence. Many thought that children should be not taught reading until the age of seven, but others wished to begin at much earlier, even at the age of three. And then it says Jewish fathers were primarily responsible for their son's instruction in the law, but remember Timothy's father was a Gentile, and so he was not a believer. And those without a living religious father, then they learned from their grandmother if they were still living. And so Timothy's grandmother was probably the most influential uh, person in young Timothy's life. And so that really behooves us. Uh, I'm a grandmother of seven, and many of you are grandmothers that we uh, can have a great influence on our grandchildren. I don't know how many women I've heard through the years that tell me um, when I asked, like, how did you come to faith in Christ? And they'd say, I had a grandmother that prayed for me. I had a grandmother that influenced me. And so, ladies, we can have a great impact on our grandchildren. Well, when considering this verse and the qualities of Timothy's mother and grandmother, it's clear if you're taking notes. They were God-fearing women who not only possessed genuine faith, but were passionate about passing it on to their offspring. They were God-fearing women who, were, who not only possessed genuine faith, but they were passionate about passing it on to their offspring. In fact, Paul is clear that not only did this faith dwell in his mother and his grandmother, but he ends by saying, and I am persuaded, Timothy, that this faith dwells in you also. There's no doubt about it. Ladies, genuine faith dwells, or the Greek word is inhabits someone, and that would be what? The promise of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, and genuine faith should have fruit, should have evidence, and Paul was convinced, Timothy, you're the real deal. You're the real deal. You are not like Demas who has forsaken me because he loved the present world. Demas denied the faith, but Timothy was in the faith. Well, as we conclude and consider those who marked Timothy's life, we think of Paul first, his spiritual father. What qualities did he possess? He was a thankful man, a servant, a man with a clear conscience. He was a man of prayer. He was a man of loving compassion. And lastly, a man of joy. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have someone like that pouring their life into you? Nobody's saying yes. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we possess these qualities so that others can follow our example? Next, we have the qualities of Timothy's mom and grandma. They were God-fearing women who not only possessed genuine faith, but were passionate about passing it on to their offspring. Ladies, we must emulate these godly women and endeavor to pass on truth to the next generation, especially when you consider that 70% of all parents now work outside the home. 
of all parents are in the workforce today. We need women committed to their children, but more than that, we need women committed to the word of God so that they can pass it on to the next generation. In fact, Susanna Wesley was one of those women that we can emulate. For all you ladies that think you have excuses, Susanna Wesley had 19 children. 19 children. And listen to this. Early in her life, she vowed she would never spend more time in pleasure than she did Bible study and prayer. In fact, even amidst her busy years as a mother, do you know she scheduled two hours a day of time of fellowship with God in his word and prayer? And they said she strictly adhered to that schedule. And can you imagine the challenge trying to find a private place with 19 children? But she did. You know what she did? Her solution was this. She brought her Bible to her favorite chair and she threw her long apron up over her head forming a tent. This became something to the tent of meeting, like the tabernacle in the days of Moses in the Old Testament. And every person in the household, even the smallest toddler to the oldest teenager, knew well when Mama did that, Mama Wesley pulled her ap apron up over her head. They were to respect her time, and they did not interrupt her unless it was a dire emergency. And there in the privacy of her tent, she interceded for her husband and children, and they said she plumbed the depth, the mysteries of God in the scripture, and the holy discipline equipped her. They said she had a thorough and a profound knowledge of the Bible. Nineteen children. Now, ladies, we have no excuses. Nineteen children. Find a long apron and put it over your head. I used to know a lady, she told me she had uh, three children. She said, I've trained my children. They are not to get out of the bed in the morning till mommy comes and gets them. This is mommy's time with God. You know, from this devoted woman, Susanna Wesley, this godly mother came Samuel, John, and Charles Wesley, who've left great legacies for the Christian world, immense legacies. My friend, we need women who are committed to two hours a day with the Savior and not to two hours a day to social media and other time wasters. Let's close in prayer. Dear Father, I want to thank you for those that impacted Timothy's life, for Paul, for Lois, for Eunice. What examples they leave for us as we think about the qualities that we want to possess because of Christ in us, so that we too can pass on to the next generation the truths of Christ, sound teaching, sound doctrine, not the gimmicks and the games that we see so many homes participating in today, but Lord, that we as women would be serious students of your word, that we would love your word, that we would love time spent with you so that then we in return can give something to our husbands and our children, our grandchildren, those within the body of believers that we belong to, Lord, that we would not be shallow, shallow, empty Christians, anemic Christians, but that we would be women on fire that are passionate, like Lois and Eunice, Father. Lord, guide us as we have our discussion time. May it be fruitful. May it be pleasing to you. And I pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen.